Again, thank you, David, and thank you for getting the opportunity to speak here. Uh, my name's Chris Lyle. I'm a, um, a taxonomist of beetles. I find my life is surrounded by weevils in the Natural History Museum. Um, in addition to that, about 15 years ago, I was very lucky um, to get seconded across to the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity. And for the three years I worked part-time for them, um, began to get an insight into the way that, that biodiversity policy works. Began, I'm still beginning to get an insight into the way it works. Um, and I'm currently, amongst other things, the UK national focal point for the CBD's Global Taxonomy Initiative, which is another policy area, which is probably pertinent to, to many of us here. But over the last 10 years or so, I've devoted quite a lot of time to looking at access to benefit sharing and the development of the Nagoya Protocol in particular. Um, sometimes with alarm, sometimes with, with enthusiasm, um, and always with a degree of concern. I'm going to obviously recover, sort of re recapitulate, recapitulate a little bit about what China said. It's kind of inevitable, um, using rather legally less uh, sensitive language, obviously, on this slide. She's, China's already shaking her head. <laughs> but the key point here is that the biodiversity of a country falls under the sovereign rights of that country. When I was young, I could go anywhere I liked, pick up whatever I wanted, and bring it home and do whatever I wanted with it. That's no longer the case. That is no longer the case. Um, countries have the right to decide whether or not I can go there and collect things, and if I do collect them, they have the right to decide what I, within limits what I can do with them. Um, and that's the world we're living in. There are lots about the world we live in which are not perfect, but it's the world we live in, and we have to manage that world to the greatest benefits. So again, CBD, great thing. Conservation of biological diversity, fairly easy concept to get your mind around. Sustainable use of biodiversity, a little bit more tricky to really understand. And fair and equitable sharing of the benefits arising out of the utilization of genetic resources is a nightmare. But that, ABS, is what we're talking about. This is not assisted breaking system, um, though it may well be. Um, but that sharing of the benefits. We're going to trip across a lot of terminology, and the terminology gets to be quite important. So a little bit about terminology. Access. Well, under the EU regulation, it's obtaining the um, genetic resources from a party um, to the Nagora Protocol, from a providing country. Um, basically, it's getting the genetic resources, and generally, as you know, genetic resources are wrapped up very neatly in biological resources. So if you're collecting biological resources, you are, by general understanding, accessing genetic resources, um, which is why you have to get a permit to pick up a beetle, irrespective of whether you're going to look at its genetics or not. Um, slightly different in Brazil. Um, Brazil has its own take on terminology. Access is when you're actually going to do the, um, the investigation of the genetic resource itself. What that pointed out to me when I was in Brazil recently is that whenever you're working with a country, you've really got to understand what they think they're talking about, not what you think they're talking about, because it might well be different. Um, benefits. We're throwing a word around the world benefit quite liberally. What does it actually mean? Um, I'll come back to that in more detail, but it's, it's good things, things that emerge. Um, it could be monetary, as China said. If, you, if you're exploiting a genetic resource, if you've discovered the, the, the next new magic cosmetic and are going to get millions out of it, you could well be asked to share monetary benefits out of that exploitation. Or it could be non-monetary. Um, information. We in this room are in the business of producing information. That's a benefit. We in this room, many of us are in the business of training other scientists, training people. That's a benefit. We'll come back to that. Utilization is to conduct research, I'm going to read it, is to conduct research and development on the genetic and or biochemical composition of genetic resources 
including through the application of biotechnology as defined in the Convention on Biological Diversity. Um, Article 2. Kind of contentious. What's research and development? Um, there are people agonizing over that one. It's not well defined. Uh, I was invited to take part in a group yesterday which is going to relook at the Frascati manual, which is used by the OECD in defining research and development, to see if we can understand what that means. I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> um, but it's still an issue, and it can be an issue in, in, in interpreting legislation. And genetic resources, basically anything that's got genes in it, functional units of heredity. Um, but again, if you're working in another country and they have, have legislation to manage access to the genetic resources, access legislation, it's what they say it is. You have to abide by the legislation of the country in which you're working. So whatever they say, if you're there trying to access material, that's what goes. And what all this legislation has been doing, and remember the convention has been in force since 1993. So we're not talking about anything new, we're talking about stuff that's been going on for the last couple of decades. Um, that's led to a lot of permit requirements, collecting permits, and we've all been there, we know what it's like. Um, you can consider them in, if you like, two parts. Um, the agreed purposes, so why you're collecting the material, and that's the country or whoever giving you prior informed consent. They know what you're going to do, and they say you can do it. And you may then have mutually agreed terms, or indeed terms laid down in the permit, um, which are the conditions under which you can do it. Yeah, you can do that if you send back the material. Yeah, you can do that if you send back a paper, whatever. And then the Nagoya Protocol. Um, came into force on 12th of October 2014, applying to those genetic resources and applying tra to traditional knowledge associated with the genetic resources. Traditional knowledge, TK, is something else which is not well defined anywhere. Um, and I'm not going to talk a lot about that, um, but bear it in mind that traditional knowledge, the information that you might get about the use of this plant, this ant, whatever, and for those of you who worked in, in, in the tropics, you'll know it's very, very hard to avoid getting told traditional knowledge. People are desperate to tell you what they do with something. It gives us a management issue in how we deal with that information. And really what the Nagoya Protocol, if you boil that down, um, there are a, a, a few key bits and pieces you think, need to think about. And remember the Nagoya Protocol is a document for governments, it's a document for negotiators, it's not necessarily a document for us as individual researchers because we're bound by national legislation and the legislation within the countries we're working. But it, it's a, a lot of interesting material in it. It requires parties to make their legislation available so people know it's there. Um, for those of us who read legislation as a, as a matter of interest, that's great. For those of us who bounce off the legal terminology, that's slightly less helpful, but at least you know there's legislation, theoretically, that you have to do something about. Um, and about monitoring user compliance. So anybody, if you're a party to the protocol, um, you're required to monitor um, utilization of genetic resources within your jurisdiction. Um, you're also required to provide an opportunity under the legal system to seek recourse in disputes arising under mutually agreed terms. So if somebody doesn't do what they say they're going to do on either side, you're supposed to provide a, a route for that to be dealt with. Lots more, but that's, that's basic. So here we are. China mentioned the EU regulation, and it is a regulation about compliance. It's about compliance by users um, of, to the Nagoya Protocol. As China said, this is binding on all member states um, to the EU, irrespective of whether they're parties. The UK has a statutory instrument uh, and a small amendation to that statutory, ins statutory instrument, um, which brings this definitely under EU UK law and how it is implemented in the UK. And as I understand it, it will stay there 
until Parliament tells us something different. Um, and this is uh, this one. Uh, this this slide came from the Commission, and, and they they love their uh, animations. Um, the main bits of the regulation are about due diligence. So as users, we're, we're, we have to ex exercise due diligence to ensure that we abide by the relevant provisions of legislation. Um, they put in place something called a register of collections, which I'm not going to talk about, to assist in that. Um, they've encouraged groups to talk about best practice, institute best practice, and they will the commissions will recognize best practice, and I will talk about that. Um, there's a system of monitoring checkpoints, and ours is the National Measurement and Regula Regulatory Office um, in the UK. Um, and they will, uh, they require information about due diligence at various points. Um, the two points they require due diligence notification from users is utilization supported by research funding, by grants, not by internal funding, um, and the utilization at the final development stage of development when it goes on to the union market, when the results go to the union market. Um, there are compliance checks. The com competent authority of the checkpoint can go look. Um, and there's a provision for penalties, and there are indeed civil penalties in the UK legislation. So the compliance checks, um, they kind of go down the value chain. And I know that as scientists working largely in academic institutions, we don't really know about value chains because we don't do value chains. We, we do research. If you think of a value chain that ends up in boots, on a shelf of boots, somebody selling something, that's what we're talking about here. So we've got that, that stages where we need to exercise due diligence and indeed possibly report on that. And that's where we acquire the material, where we access the material in the first place. We need to make sure that all those ranks of plants or bird skins or beetles or whatever are actually accessed legally. And we can demonstrate their access legally. We need to demonstrate to our own satisfaction they were accessed legally. And there's various bits of paper you might need to do that. We need to transmit certain information to third parties if we pass over those genetic resources for utilization mandated under the regulation. Um, we need to report that due diligence. Yes, it's legal. Um, I can show you the documents if you want when we utilize under research funding. We need to report again um, or alternatively when the, 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 the result goes on the market. And there are forms to specify what should be reported, and indeed some of that information goes public on the Access and Benefit Sharing Clearinghouse for anybody to look at, the user country is notified. That's unless it's confidential, in which case it doesn't, but there are other routes for that. So um, that first, uh, second checkpoint about passing on, we have to seek, keep transfer to subsequent users, something called the Internationally Recognized Certificate of Compliance. So if you're collecting from a, accessing material from a, it gets better. <laughs> um, if you're accessing from a party to the protocol, and I would say that the EU, EU regulation applies only to genetic resources accessed from a party to the Nagoya Protocol, which was a party at the time the resources were accessed. So it's not retrospective, it's just with other parties. So at, at this moment, it only applies, actually I think it's to 78 parties because the others are in a 90 day period from depositing their, um, their documents at the UN to being fully a party, and that doesn't count, I think. Um, but uh, the number of parties is growing. And there are various bits of information you have to trans transmit. Um, when you make a declaration to the checkpoint, um, you're basically saying where you got it, when you got it, um, what it is, who got it, what you're doing with it, uh, and do you have a permit, prior informed consent, mutually agreed terms, um, if applicable, because not all countries require that. Not all countries have access legislation. France does, we don't. Um, but a large number of countries do. 
rather dense slide, um, but it's just indicative. The sort of information that you, we all require to hold and manage in order to be compliant, in order to manage our resources, genetic resources, legally and effectively, this is only a bit of it. Um, but we do have to think about the data management systems we have to ensure that we have the information that we are able to transmit to other users. We have the information that we can transmit to uh, the authorities. Uh, and we have the information to understand what we're doing. So that has quite significant data implications, data management implications. And as that's only a, a small part of a rather larger table of information. Um, I put that because it's pretty. That is sort of generalized workflow of my museum. Um, the sort of stuff we do. We go collecting, we bring stuff in, uh, we decide whether we use it or not, we decide whether to keep it or not, decide to keep it for other people. Each of those red diamonds is a point where a member of staff has to take a decision that has an ABS implication. Which means each of those points is a place where we do not want the staff to be wandering around not knowing what to do. So we have to have policies or procedures in place to ensure that the staff aren't wandering around wondering what to do and the institution itself isn't wandering around wondering what to do. Um, and that starts getting a framework of the sorts of things we need to ensure that as institutions, individuals, we need to manage. We need to know how to react. We need to know what we're going to do. So there are risks. There are clear risks. And the risks of protocol, the risks of ABS compliance. Um, one, th th this actually Wordle is generated from the EU regulation on the Nagoya Protocol. I put the whole thing in, see what came out. Um, genetic came out quite high. Collections is down. Collections is there. And it does kind of overwhelm us. Um, clearly, there's a, there's a potential problem for massive uh, administration costs. Uh, I did a, a back of the envelope calculation um, on the reporting requirement likely for the Natural History Museum and that came out at potentially um, one full-time equivalent. So one full-time equivalent just involved in reporting issues. That is untenable. You're going to have to manage that in some way. Um, but clearly there's, there's, there's a risk there. But other than that, yes, we have to manage the EU regulation. We have to manage the UK regulation. But a lot of the rest of it has been there for the last two decades. ABS has been on, on, the, on the table. It's been there. And we just haven't necessarily noticed. Um, and indeed, my, my first collecting permit was in 86, so before um, the convention even. But again, that held obligations. Those obligations still apply to me and my institution. Um, it hasn't gone away. So, we can talk about the UK law. And the, um, as far as we can talk about UK, European regulation, we can talk about the protocol. But actually, ABS, the issues that impact us are much, much bigger than that. And that's really what we've got to be thinking about managing, not just the protocol. Yeah, we, we need to do that. Clearly, we need to do that. We need to look at that whole thing, whole area. And I think, uh, sorry, another dense slide. Um, what we are, what the legislation in, in the EU is doing is managing um, compliance with regulations in parties to the protocol, not non-parties. Um, our requirements are quite simple. We've got to obey the provided country laws and we've got to obey, abide the, um, look for prior informed consent if required. What the legislation does not do is look at the conditions which we agreed with those provider countries. It doesn't look at the contractual terms. That's not under the legislation. They're just obliged to provide a route for any dispute settlement if, if required, but it doesn't, it doesn't actually look at those terms. Again, similar to what China just showed, um, it's not academic. People do get arrested. People do get put in prison. 
um, people do have reputational damage from not getting permits. And I know it can be difficult getting a permit. One of our staff came back a little while ago from uh, uh, an embassy uh, and told me that on inquiring what permit he needed, the guy said, oh, well, it's just insects. Just wrap them in your underpants and put them in your suitcase. <laughs> this is unhelpful and probably not official. Um, but this is one of the ri issues, risks we've been working with. We have been on our, or I think all, working with the issues of contractual non-compliance. Um, those permits have conditions, the memorandum of cooperation we have have conditions, and there are all sorts of conditions that we ought to be applying. But managing that, especially with a huge collection, with multiple entries every year, is a challenge. It's a major challenge. Um, taking 20, 30 permits in various languages and making sure that every time somebody can touch a per, uh, touches a specimen, they know what they can, cannot, and must do with that specimen is a real issue. Um, and of course, it's easy, increasingly easy, for countries to spot non-compliance. Um, and I know people sitting in offices scanning scientific literature to find out, first of all, if the material was collected legally or not. Um, it, it happens now. Um, with increased open access, people are going to be able to s spot more, you know, what's going on and whether permit conditions have been met or not. Good thing about the Nagoya Protocol, that, that's all kind of worrying about, yeah, let's think of the good side, because there is a good side. It's helped us think through what we need to do. It's actually focused the mind again. Um, how do we manage our collections legally, effectively? Um, and that is a very good thing. And I've, I've, you know, the fact you're all here listening to talk about the Nagoya Protocol is a good thing because it, it, you're thinking about what the issues might be. It's helped develop some tools, and we're still developing tools, um, to manage our collections more effectively, to manage how we deal with contractual clauses more effectively. We're not there yet, but we're getting there. It should re resist, reduce our risk. If we get this right, it'll mean we're less at risk than we have been in the past, um, even if we haven't recognized it. But as the world is changing, then that risk is potentially going to get greater. And it should be improving our relationships with the people we're working with, improving the relationships with the provider countries. So I mentioned best practice. There's one. Um, that's a code of conduct and best practice from the Consortium of European Taxonomic Facilities. And a group of us spent a couple of years, including China and myself, um, trying to work this one through and decide what we did need to have in place as best practice to be compliant, particularly with a protocol, but also you know, with a wider um, ABS issues. Um, and it deals with you know, being lawful. I mean, the first thing is about abiding by the law. It should be a no-brainer, but let's just have it down to make sure. Um, how we acquire material, uh, how we curate it, how we use data, how we manage those data, how we utilize, how we share benefits, the policies, we reckon there are about 17 different policy areas you might need to address uh, to get it right, either in a single policy or lots of policies, because all of us do policies in different ways. But it's ma a matter of checking off those boxes, really, thinking back to those red diamonds. Have you got something either in policy or process that enables you to tick that off? And then training, of course. Uh, that's online. There's a, a URL there. Um, we have submitted that to the Commission for recognition. Um, and the Commission sent it to uh, all of the uh, national authorities across the member states. It's come back with some comments and suggestions, and they're waiting for us to get back to them, having responded to those. Um, they were particularly concerned, I think, that it was quite general. One of our issues is that having CTAP itself has 59 members, every one of those with a different set of policies the policy framework. So we can't be prescriptive. We can only talk about desired outcomes or uh, required outcomes. So we're just talking to the Commission about that. Um, but we're hopeful they will recognize this, which will actually take a bit of the heat off because the uh, competent authorities work on a risk-based assessment in terms of checks. 
if, we, if this is recognized and the organizations accept it, use it, then that reduces their, potentially their administrative load. And there are various other tools that we've been developing as well. Um, standard material transfer agreements. So every time you, pr you, you supply a specimen or a sample to somebody else, ideally you're doing that with a document which talks about that transfer, which sets commissions, um, conditions on the transfer, which conveys that necessary information under the regulation, um, which actually, again, thinks about all the, all the things that you need to transfer, all those documents you do need to transfer to a third party. Um, also one that's about material coming in. So you know when you accept material, you get a quick list of all the things you need to know about that material, including its provenance and how legal it is. Um, we have a use of biological material statement, and that's basically, if you look at, if you look at permits, um, they'll often say, yeah, you can take this away. Okay, does that mean we can sequence it or we can't? Uh, can we do biochemical analysis or can't we? What can we do? The idea of this is that it makes it clear what we can and cannot do. So it basically sets out all the things that we might do with material in a taxonomic institution framework. And that would form part of the agreement, staple to the permit if need be. And if a provider country doesn't like something, they can cross it out. But at least we understand downstream what we can do with the stuff and what we can't. And if the provider country wants to cross most of it out, then actually we don't take it. It's no good to us. Um, there's no point in accessing material if you can't do the things that as an institution, as a researcher, you need to do. Um, and, and a bit of sort of tough thought is needed. It's because of that sort of tough thought that Brazil changed its regulations. It's because of that tough thought Philippines changed its leg legislation. People stopped working there. Um, we're looking at standard clauses. I said about permits. Um, every permit's different. That gives you a huge data management issue. If you can start standardizing clauses with provider countries, data management gets a lot easier. That's in the protocol as a desired outcome. People are thinking about it, working at it. Um, extensions to Darwin Core, so we can actually start putting some of this information into the Darwin Core, into our databases, and get, getting it translated, transferred easily. Um, Global Genome Biodiversity Network's been working on that, and that's now published. And so on, so tools being developed. China's already, already mentioned this tool, the ABS Clearinghouse, set up by the CBD Secretariat. This is where you find the information you need. Touch wood. Um, this is where countries are supposed to put up their uh, national competent authority, that, well, their competent authority, their focal point, their legislation. So if you go to a country here, you should be able to see it's got legislation. Some have put it up, not all. Um, you should be able to set the next slide. Yeah, there's, there's us, um, slightly out of date. Um, you should be able to see the address of the focal point, and that person has a responsibility to uh, inform inquirers about requirements. Don't always answer the emails, don't always answer the phone, but it's worth trying. I don't want to portray the world as smoothly functioning because it ain't. Um, but this is a tool which at least goes some of the way, and the more we can encourage countries to use it, the better. Um, and there's quite a lot of other information here, including um, the International Check uh, Certificate of Compliance, which is what a country might produce. So if a country issues a permit, it can then, it should then, publish elements of that permit on here, so anybody can see it. And when I last looked, there were, um, about 30 odd certificates uh, available. So you can see what's being done in various countries. Um, the UK is desperate to put up the first checkpoint communique, which is the report from that uh, due diligence declaration. Uh, as, as yet, nobody's produced one, but I know that and, and our competent authority is, is on the phone quite regularly to a particular researcher asking when she's going to be able to produce one. Um, but again, that'll, go, that'll be made public. Um, and you can hook into that, the, 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 under, the underlying um, information and that. 
and plug it into your own database. The, the Secretariat has, has produced that. We still have to deal with that contract, contract, manage, contract management as users. Um, and that's an issue. That's something we've really got to get, get our minds around in a, in a big way. Um, and there are various things you might do. Um, you can, there's a, there's, um, a chap called Paul Oldham who's, who's been developing a system of putting permit information for a given country into barcodes. Theoretically, you could put that into your own, those barcodes onto your specimens using a barcode reader and immediately get to the, the information. That's quite neat. But nobody's doing it yet, it's just theoretical. Um, Long-term agreements with countries. Um, a good way of developing relationships, a good way of, of really understanding what, ne what is needed is obviously a longer-term agreement because people have got more invested in it. Quick in and out trips give you a lot of problems because you've got a lot of different permits. Long-term, you've got fewer um, and more possibility of, of, of managing them. Why so many permits? Why is it so difficult? China said, right from the beginning of the convention, access was a thing. All countries could do was manage access. Benefit sharing, hopefully the people who came and accessed the material shared benefits they said they would. If they didn't, what could they do? Compliance was no means of ensuring compliance in another country. So we had basically a T shape which isn't very stable, so countries put a lot of effort into access regulations. We've now got something much more stable than the Goa Protocol. The compliance mechanism there, hopefully, we will see more of this simplified access coming through because countries have more confidence that their rights are going to be managed in the user countries. We talked about benefit sharing. And those monetary and the non-monetary benefits. That's what the convention's about. Benefits is really unfamiliar language to us. But think about that training, the capacity building, leaving material, uh, equipment, microscopes, cars, whatever we work with in countries. Think about sharing specimens, returning specimens to the country they came from. Think about sharing our scientific outputs so they can be used in the countries where the biodiversity exists. Think about training, funding local counterparts. This sort of thing we all do, these are the benefits that are being talked about. Now, we're not actually terribly good at doing that, by and large. Very broad brush, but uh, you always hear complaints, oh, I had to found a counterpart, he never even turned up. Okay, doesn't matter, part of a deal. Sometimes they do turn up, sometimes they, they turn up and become really good research partners, which is what we really want, of course. Send material back. What happened to it? Who knows? It rotted somewhere. Okay, tough. Tough. It happens. Um, it was theirs. You had an agreement. In the same way, I'm not, the, the question you raised earlier about, yeah, it's going to get destroyed. What's wrong with just taking it? I may come to your house and I look at your house and you, you've got a lovely picture there, but you've, you haven't dusted it. It's in the light. You're really not valuing this. Should I just take it? I think not. <laughs> that's where we are. <laughs> that's what, whatever they're doing, that, that's, you know, under international law, that's where we are. And we need to start beefing that up to change the situation, to help countries value, understand, care for, use, have the capacity for managing not only their biodiversity in the field, but the biodiversity in collections, the information we provide on collections. We're not always good at delivering that information. Countries aren't always very good at using that information. You know, send back a paper. I'll send back a paper. It goes to an office. <laughs> Gone. How do we improve that? How do we make the most of what we do? We are doing some really good stuff, yeah? So how do we make the most of that? How does that get translated into a real change on the ground? Which is what this is actually about. Taxonomy, we say, is the basis of all biodiversity. We're always saying things like that, which means we've got to actually put our money where our mouth is. How do we ensure that it is? How do we ensure help it to be used as a basis? We have a GTI. There's an international policy. 
190 odd countries agreed that there were too few keys to the genera of bees. Do you know that? <laughs> Stuff's out there. Really heavy policy stuff. How do we start turning the protocol, how do we start turning ABS into something which really starts delivering against this, delivers about against the biodiversity crisis we're in? Um, article 9 of the protocol. To encourage users and providers to direct benefits arising from the utilization of genetic resources towards conservation of biological diversity and sustainable use of its components. The protocol is offered us to start using the information, supplying the information, so it can get used effectively. Most countries have national biodiversity strategies and action plans. One of the things, again, under the convention. You can find them on the CBD website. And if you're working with a country, you really need to look at that because that's giving you the priorities, that's giving you what they need in terms of biodiversity management and often in terms of biodiversity information. Um, it sets out what they want, capacity, information, um, research. And the more we work with countries as researchers, the more we can understand that and the more we can start ensuring that what we're doing can actually land on the desk of somebody in the country who can use it to further that MBSAP, to further that country's biodiversity policies. In the UK, we've had the Darwin Initiative for the last 20 odd years, set up in response to um, CBD, an early response uh, by John Major. And that's very much about meeting, putting your scientific information, putting your research into the context of the biodiversity policies of the countries with which you're working. It's about making that link. Policy isn't over there, it's, it's around us and, and pervades what we do. And increasingly funders are aware of, of, of using that ABS legislation to assist in developing biodiversity, sustainability, conservation. Um, and there is a very wide interest in developing capacity. So we've got bits, and I see this as a real opportunity. We've got funding interest at the moment. We've got those national biodiversity strategies. We've got national implementation, we've got the scientific output. For goodness sake, we can bring these together in a more effective way. So one way, for example, a lot of us in our collections, the, the information gets digitized, and it goes off to GBIF for specimen data and observations. It goes off to Catalog of Life for names. It goes off to Biodiversity Heritage Library for publications. It goes to EOL for, for broken down information about descriptions. It goes to Bold or GenBank for sequence data and so on and so on and so on. Basically, we're feeding a lot of what we're doing into a set of pipelines. The disjunct. Are those pipelines actually reaching the countries with which we're working? Well, that's, I think, a really quite important area to work in, to help, help them do just that. With, there are instances already of quarantine officers um, getting DNA sequencing, CO1 sequencing done about I against intercepts and running those against bold to identify potential pests. So they're all doing it as individuals, not as national representatives. We just need to up that game a bit to, to make it more usable um, and help countries really use this stuff. Because that is, to my mind, where we ought to be going. Um, in many ways, we, we, we can't stay as we are. We can't carry on doing research in the way we've done. The, lands, the world's changing. We can't go on looking at biodiversity in the way we've gone because it's going away. We're losing it. And I think we have to be thinking, you know, as part of an impetus from ABS Nagoya, part of an impetus from, from where we are in the world, about how we might look at the work we do. Do we need to change that? Do we need to change the way we prioritize, the way we produce our outputs, how we work with people? So I'd say the protocol is actually an opportunity like all good threats, it's a good opportunity.